Good evening. Uh, we're going to be looking at Romans 5.10 here. 4 uh, and 11. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of the Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have now received the atonement. Lord, we just thank you for this uh, wonderful time together with each other. Lord, we just love and appreciate everybody here. We pray for uh, some are carrying <clears throat> heavy burdens and some are going to, uh, some are just wrestling with issues that are unresolved. And I pray that you come down in a very powerful way. Lord, you solve these issues and that you meet each one of us. And we just thank you for everything. And we say this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul was uh, trying to set forth the reality of redemption uh, in terms of what it cost God. You know, one time I was uh, writing a, a story, and it was about a, a lady that was coming to terms with her sin. And uh, she was saying, well, it's not so bad. And the other lady with her said, it's not about how bad you your sin was, it's about how holy God is. And a lot of people don't understand it really comes down to the holiness of God. It doesn't come down to how bad we think our sin is or how bad we don't think it is. It comes down to that, that God is that holy. That even if you only committed one sin, he'd still have to go to the cross and die for you. That's the standard of God's holiness. And so we have to really realize that. And so as Paul was describing us in this, he says we're first of all ungodly. Christ had to die for us. And then while we were um, yet sinners, he, he commended his love towards us. That's sinners. And then we come down to the fact that we're enemies of God. And so no matter how you look at it, you have a problem with sin. And that's what Paul's trying to get through to people because they don't want to really acknowledge some people, well, I'm not so bad. Maybe you're not. But the issue is that God is that holy. He is so holy that he cannot look at any sin. And it has to be addressed. And so uh, God is the one that had to pay the price for our sin. And so when we look at it, uh, we, were, we are ungodly, which means we're unworthy of any kind of consideration of God. And yet, he still died for us. We're sinners. We have transgressed the law. And yet, he commanded his love towards us that his son should die for us. And we are enemies of God. We're hostile towards him. Because you know what? We want life on our terms. And God says, I can't accept life on your terms, okay? It's my terms. And so as we look at this, and we're going to get into it more, but there was no hope. There's no hope outside of God for you people, for me. There's no hope outside of God. And we are doomed. We are lost. We are destined to stand before the law and be condemned and to damnation. It's just the reality and Paul's really trying to get it in because there was these Jews that thought, oh, well, I'm not so bad, I'm a Jew. There were Greek Gentiles that said, oh, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. He says, you don't get it. We're all bad. Jesus died for all of us. He died in, in, on our behalf for all of us. And so he's really trying to get people to understand that they are in a hopeless state. They're in a hopeless state. There's no hope outside of what God has done for us. Yes, Jesus died for us. That's true. But his death was as much about, again, God's holiness as, as it was about our miserable plight. We have to. God connected the holiness of God to what? Pathetic mankind. There's no way he could do that unless... He could satisfy the law unless he could address the sin, unless he could change our status. 
And that's what Jesus did on the cross. And Paul was trying to really get that down. Now, being ungodly made us profane before God. We have to understand that. Uh, being sinners made us lawless. Okay, we're, we're breakers of the law and we're traitors to God. We just don't really understand that. Because we don't start out to be treacherous. We don't start out to be that way. Well, I'm a pretty decent person. I used to think that when I was a kid. And then the Lord had to bring me face to face with my character. And I found this terrible iniquity in me. I found unclean things in my character. And it's very hard to face. Because we can delude ourselves about our character. We can delude ourselves about our action. But when God brings up that mirror, and the mirror is not your best, the mirror is his holiness. And you begin to say, oh my goodness, God, I'm a sinner. I'm in trouble. I'm lost. And so that's the reality of it. So we're lawless, the sinners, we're lawless, we're traitors, but we're enemies. That means there's enmity between our creator and us. So Jesus became that lamb whose blood redeemed us. Now there's that mathematical term of purchasing us, okay? He redeemed us in our ungodly state. He washed away our sins. That's called reckoning. And he brought reconciliation between God and us. Now it's important to keep in mind the blood was often shed between enemies to establish a covenant. Now, if you ever, uh, you read through the Bible, you, you see where after uh, Moses offers the sacrifice, God makes the covenant with the earth. There has to be some kind of cutting. In fact, covenant means cutting. So there's some kind of cutting that happens uh, between two people that make a covenant. Oftentimes they uh, will offer sacrifice. And sometimes they'll even cut their hands or their fingers, and they call them blood brothers at that point. But there's a cutting that shows there's a covenant. There's an agreement there, and it costs you something. And the reason they use blood, as we talked about, blood, according to God, that's where the life is. That's where the life is in the blood. It's not in the body, it's in the blood. So the blood, life was shed so we could have life. And that's what it comes down to. So when we talk about covenant, most of the time covenant was to bring peace or agreement. You had to have some kind of place of agreement so you could meet and bring peace between you. And so when that covenant's made, please hear me, it's about peace. Bringing peace because there's some kind of uh, uh, opposition going on, some kind of disagreement, some kind of concern going on. So it's a way of bringing peace. Reconciliation is about peace. Now, we have a ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we are responsible to point people to Christ. We're called peacemakers. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We are peacemakers. We have been given the gospel to bring peace. The gospel in the uh, armor is, are the shoes. You shod your feet with the gospel of what? Peace, reconciliation. Most of the time we're talking about salvation and not reconciliation. But that's what it's all about. You see, Jesus, it wasn't just that he died for your sins. It's that now you can be reconciled back into a relationship with God. You now can have peace with God. And you can have that re relationship with God. So what drives people apart? War, conflict, strife. So when you talk to married couples that are having problems, what do you need? Well, we need agreement. Why do you need agreement? So we can have peace. It's called reconciliation. Couples need to be reconciled back to one another in a relationship. It's the same way with God. And so uh, Paul is bringing all of this out, okay? Uh, when we get to the point of reconciliation, though, it points to a glorious connection of not only peace, 
but a, pla a place of exchange. You see, reconciliation is about an exchange being made. That's why when they talk about a covenant, some kind of exchange has to be made that brings them equal to each other so they can come into agreement with each other. Today, a lot of people, if you don't believe me, you just watch our politicians. They don't care if they have peace with us. They see us as peons. So they figure we can be sacrificed. They don't need any agreement with us. So in any kind of agreement, what you have to do is if someone doesn't have the means to meet you on equal ground, you won't see any need for agreement. You won't have a reason for agreement. So you always have to bring people up in exchange equal ground so what you can exchange is of the same value and the same worth. So when we get into reconciliation, we're talking about being brought to a place where we are equal so the exchange can be properly made. Now, what are we exchanging at the cross? Our old life for a new life. That's what we're making. And who brought that equality to the cross? Christ, as man and God. You see, we don't quite really realize how important it was for Jesus to be both God and man. Because as God, he is equal with the Father, as man, he became equal with us, and in reconciliation, he lifts us up so we are equal, on equal playing ground. So that we can have peace and agreement. And if Christ didn't do that, there would be no equal playing ground. You could never be reconciled. There has to be that exchange, and Christ became that exchange for us. Now, at, re at the cross, redemption was displayed, in other words, the price was, for our sins was paid in full, okay, to bring, point, to bring us to a point of satisfying a debt we could not pay. But at the grave of Jesus, this is an important thing, reckoning was made that said, what? The debt has been written off. Why? Because he took the sins to the grave. So the debt has been reckoned as a write-off, a bad debt. And so now the sins are in the grave. It can't bring any accusation. It's as if we never sin, so we can stand justified. Without the sins being taken to the grave, we couldn't stand justified because the sins would be still there bringing accusation against us. But Jesus became sin, and he was put in the grave with those sins. Now, guess where our sins remain when he rose from the grave? In the grave. I love what Psalms uh, uh, 103, I'll read it really quickly for you, because it's one of the ones that as a new Christian, I actually had to learn, and it, it brought comfort to me. It's found in Psalms 103, I'll just read it to you. Uh, if you don't know it, I would underline it for encouragement purposes. But what it says in 103 is this, 12 and 13. Actually, I'll read through 15. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Okay, there's no point where we can determine when the east and the west begins. We can with the north and south. We have the poles but we can't with east and west. And so what he's saying is, you cannot begin to imagine <laughs> because they have been cast far away, the east is the west, because there is no way to tell where the west begins and the east begins. And so that's what he's done with our sins, okay? But it goes on to say in 103, which I, it says, like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes 
for the wind passes over it and it's gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. And so we're passing through here. And what God has done and what he wants to do is forgive your sins, to forgive it. But you have to face it. You have to confess it. You have to give it to him. You have to say, yes, Lord, I don't want this anymore. This doesn't please you. It doesn't please me. Here it is. I agree with you. As soon as you agree with God about a sin, guess what? It brings you level with him. You have a place of agreement. So there's a lot going on. So it's, is that the grave of Jesus? Reckoning was made that wrote the dead of our sin off as being no more. As if we never sinned, we've, we've never incurred a debt. Now, the debt could no longer be held against us. Praise the Lord for that. You stand justified as if you never sinned. We, we stand now complete, justified, our sins taken away, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now, here we come to this something called glorious reconciliation. As I said, it has to do with the exchange. You know, redemption pays the debt. Reckoning rights, writes the bad debt off as being paid in full. But reconciliation is about making all things equal, balance out, no more debts, no more deficiency. It's all balanced out. It's all equal. And it's all done in Christ. It's all done in Christ. He's that bridge. The law of God is now satisfied by the payment. The reckoning was completed. And reconciliation points to restoration of your relationship with God. A relationship was broken because of sin, but because of redemption is now restored. That's what we have in Christ. You see, the problem with a lot of Christians today is we don't know what we have in Christ. We don't understand justification. We don't understand redemption. We don't understand reckoning. We don't understand reconciliation. When we talk about uh, being Christians, we talk about our salvation, not about reconciliation. We don't talk about, now I have a relationship with a living God. You know, I was lost, I was separated. Now I have a relationship with a living God because of what Jesus Christ did for me. I have to admit, all the years that I've gone to churches, I've probably heard reconciliation used maybe five times on my hand, one hand. That's a crime. Because everything Jesus did was to equal the playing field so we could have that relationship with God. That's what was important to God. It's important to God today that you and I each have that relationship. Now, our redemption, at redemption, our soul was purchased. Now, remember, we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. How many of you know that? Well, guess what? Our soul has to be redeemed. How many of you know that? Your soul has to be redeemed. Because what does the Bible say? The Bible says that we actually sell our soul. So it has to be bought back. It has to be redeemed. Now, when we get to our spirit, uh, that's a little uh, different, okay? When we get to our spirit, it means that life has been infused into our spirit. Through the born-again process, through the reckoning process, we have been infused with life in our spirit. We have been revived. We have been quickened. But here comes the body. You say, I have to put up with this old body? No. No. I'm going to tell you something about your body. It can't be redeemed. Oh, thank God. Let me tell you something about your body. It can't be revived. Why? It's dying. Insist on dying. Insist on dying. So what has to occur with your body? Because you're going to be completely, completely reconciled back to God. Your body, soul, and spirit. So redemption is complete, but what about our body? Right? 
Now, as we look at it, we know reconciliation is that an exchange has been taken, uh, taken place, but it's a process. How many of you understand the exchange is a process? Now, the cross of Christ, any cross has two sides. The one side of the cross of Christ is that dark side that represents our old life. We come up to the cross, and we often come from behind it. We look up and say, well, I know that cross is for me. But we often remain in darkness on that dark side. Say, well, okay, I know he died for me. That's not where the exchange. You never make exchange in the darkness. The other side is the light. That's the side where Christ died on the cross. And so... If you're going to have the great exchange made, you have to go into the light. Remember, the light is the life of Christ. The light's infused into us by faith. But we stand in the light of Christ, and we receive that gift of salvation in the light of Christ. Now, before our salvation, we walk in darkness towards God, blindly walking, walking towards the abyss of our destruction. We all know that. But on the other side is that light, the life of Christ, available to all who will come, receive the gift of salvation. It's a gift, people. And to be born again with the light of God, the life of Christ. But we have to come to the front of the cross. We have to face our sin. We have to ask forgiveness. We have to humble ourselves say, God, if you don't do something on my behalf, I'm lost forever. We have to have a sense of that. But we also have been called to pick up our personal cross. You know, this exchange of the life at the cross, we have this exchange of the different type of life at the cross, but at the grave we have the exchange of burden. Do you realize at the grave we leave all of our guilt all of our burden of guilt behind, okay, the guilt of sin for the great burden of love. But at our personal cross, the exchange is of my fleshly, my worldly lifestyle. I exchange it. I let go of my personal rights, my personal dreams, and my plans of the old to pursue after the abundant life in Christ. You see, when Christ comes into you, you have eternal life. But for it to be a fruitful life, you have to walk it out. You have to cultivate it. You have to nourish it. You have to uh, do whatever you have to to bring out that abundant life in Christ. It's a fruitful life. What happens with a lot of people is they receive eternal life, but they never gain that abundant life. And they sit there dissatisfied with Christianity. They sit there saying, well, this is just religious duty. This is just nonsense. This is a bunch of do's and don'ts. This is a bunch of, I, you know, I've heard all of it. I've been there myself. And then I realize that the eternal life is there. Yes, it identifies me to my eternal inheritance. But that abundant life, that fruitful life comes when I begin to exercise the life of Christ in my life. When I live his life and not my own. Then I'm going to see the abundant life. And the abundant life means a full, complete, satisfying life. When I was on the road of religion, I got frustrated. I was left feeling lean and feeling dissatisfied and think, this is, this is Christianity? No, it wasn't. I had to, I had to learn. Rayola, it's religion. You're doing it in your own terms. You're doing it your own way. You're trying to be good. You're trying to be all these things because people put all these burdens on you. And when I finally went and said, you know what? This is not a relationship. This is religion. I want a relationship then that's when I began to discover that wonderful, abundant life of Christ that every believer has. And it became satisfying. It became fruitful. I've never looked back and regretted doing, following Christ. Never have. And I've had, we've had tough times, but come forth, and, and the precious nuggets that come out of it are so priceless and valuable, 
you'll say, I don't want to go through that again. But, oh, praise God I went through it. That's the beauty of the abundant life I'm talking about. So at my personal cross, I exchange all these things that I think life is. And I want you to know, the world offers you a lifestyle, not life. That's all it offers you. And this lifestyle says, this is going to make you happy. How many of you have cha chased after the lifestyle the world says is going to make you happy and found out it didn't? What Christ offers you is life. It's not a lifestyle. It's life itself. It's breathing. It's active. It's real. And it brings you into a relationship with Christ. And you see, that's all the world can offer you is a lifestyle. You know why? Because it has no life in it. The world is basically dying, dead, temporary. It has no life in it. And so people become disillusioned with the life the world offers because there's no life in it. It's not satisfying. It doesn't address the inner, inner person of who you are and what you need. Now, you, it's, it's hard to get people to understand that, okay? But that's what it comes down to. Now, anytime you, you fail to try to walk in that life of Christ, you are going to fail to know the abundant life, the complete life, the satisfying life. And you can only discover that by picking up your own personal cross where you say, you know what? This is not about me. This is about the Lord. <laughs> This has to go. I have to let this go if I'm going to grab a hold of this. That's called the exchange. It's constantly being made. I've been making that exchange ever since I've been a Christian. And some of it was pretty devastating to me, I thought. And yet, what I let go was nothing. It had no life to it. What I grabbed a hold of was life. And I've never regretted that. So... At the cross of Christ, we gain a different life, but at our personal cross, we gain a new way. We let go of the old way, and we gain a new way. So at Jesus' cross, we lose the old life to receive his life, but when it comes to our personal cross, we lose the old way in order to walk in a new way, the disciplined way, the way of a disciple, the godly way according to the path of righteousness. Now, our bent has to change, okay? And so how you change your bent is you change your attitude about things. And once your attitude changes about something, then your conduct changes. The problem is that we try to put religion over a bad attitude, and we wonder why it doesn't work. It's because the whole, pur the whole purpose of the cross is to get us to ban or the right way in our attitude. Because if I'm not willing to let go of this, because my attitude is, I'm going to hold on to it no matter what. Well, guess what? You're going to have a foul attitude down the line. It's going to be pretty rotten, and you're going to be very unhappy with God. So I have to realize that God is after my attitude. Okay, he's trying to change the bent in my life. So choosing righteousness is going to be a natural thing. I can let go of the world. I can let go of the lifestyle. I can let go of this because this is so natural now. This makes sense. This is what's going to be satisfying to me, not the other way around. So however, there's one aspect to complete the fullness of our redemption. We're here we're exchanging our life at the cross of Christ. We're exchanging our way with our cross. But there's one other thing that has to occur. Okay? To make us equal, to make it complete. And that is to do with resurrection. See, our soul was bought on the cross of Christ. Our spirit is being brought forth with our cross as we give way to the real life of Christ. But there's something called resurrection. You know what resurrection is about? I love this part. 
you're going to get a new body. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of this body. It's breaking down. It's wearing down. You know, Chris, uh, G Carrie laughed the other, I know, it was a week ago. I'm in the bathroom trying to situate everything and move everything around and, you know, oh, all the things you do. And our bathroom's not very big. She's leaning down, cleaning up something, and she heard my voice. And I don't know what I ever said. I said something about, something about getting old. What was it, old? Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, our older bodies don't work right. I'm in there complaining about my body working. She's on the other side of the door laughing. I'm still trying to adjust myself in this small bathroom, trying to get ready. And I said, what are you laughing about? She's out there just having a gay old time laughing at my getting older. Someone said, getting old is not for sissies. That's not. But you know what? I'm looking forward to the new body that I'm going to receive. It's called a glorified body. You see, when Christ went to the grave, he left the old body behind the sin. When he rose, he had a glorified body. And guess what? We're going to have a glorified body. When we are raised again on that day, that day called Resurrection Day, we're going to have a new body. Right now, people are in heaven, their spirit and soul is there, but they still don't have their body. They're not in a glorified body yet. And you say, well, why do you need a glorified body? Because that's part of your inheritance. You will be glorified with Christ. You are co-heirs with Christ. We're talking about a friend that her body was basically being destroyed, car accident, had changed her looks, uh, you know, kidney, dialysis, all this stuff. And she was just, her body was just racked with all kinds of physical problems. I, but she was an incredible person because she kept her sense of humor. And I can't imagine that. I mean, she was in a car accident where they had to reconstruct her face. She even did, didn't even look the same. And she didn't like how she looked. And, yeah, she was a beautiful, uh, she, used, she was a rodeo queen in her day. Beautiful lady. And anyway, uh, we were talking to her one day, and, and, you know, this is, I brought this up last time, but uh, we were saying to her, you know, we're talking about uh, what's going to happen to us. And I said, you know what? You're going to have a new body. And she said, I'm going to have a new body? <gasps> I'm going to have a new body. And it was like this, this light came from above and just, just penetrated on her, and her, her face changed. I mean, the wrinkles went out of it. She's like, I'm going to have a new body? And she was just absolutely overwhelmed by that idea. And we all witnessed that. There were three of us sitting there. That night she went home with the Lord. To be with the Lord. But you know what? She went home. I'm going to have a new body. We're going to have a glorified body just like Christ. It's, going to, it's part of our inheritance. It's going to be us realizing the fullness of our redemption. You know what you're going to realize? Is that when Jesus said, it's finished, it's full, it's complete. That he has totally redeemed every part of you from your spirit, soul to your body. We will see it, our body, in the future. That's the beauty we have. We are going to be equal with him in our inheritance, in our resurrection. We're going to have a glorified body. Now, our soul was redeemed, our spirit reckoned as being born again. We now can look forward to our inheritance, that which will be brought forth in resurrection, gaining that new glorified body that will never die. We won't get old. Oh, thank God. We won't have pains. We, don't, we won't care if we eat or not. Oh, yay. We won't have to sleep at night. Wow. <laughs> that sleeping at night really takes a lot of time, by the way. Anyway, so I want you, some don't get to sleep. I, I mean, uh, I, I relate to some people here who 
don't know what sleep is all night long. long. But anyway, we don't have to worry about it. Our bodies won't need it. So we're looking forward to gaining a new body. In redemption, justification has been made available. In reckoning, it's the beginning of the ongoing work of sanctification. Because you've got that exchange where the old, the sins have been taken away so you can walk in newness again. But in resurrection, we will be brought forth in glorification. A new glorified body like Jesus' glorified body, this is when we will com be completely equal in our inheritance with him. So at the cross, we have been translated into a new kingdom because of justification. In reckoning, we can trust that our inner be man is being sanctified and transformed. However, in resurrection, we know that we will be transferred. So you have one where we, you're translated into the kingdom of light. And in uh, the soul, you're being transformed. And in resurrection, you're going to be transferred. And so there's just a lot that's going on uh, in our great promises in the Lord. So what an incredible future we have to look forward to. What? to a wonderful prospect to walk towards a promise of inheritance, to walk and gain what's, what is gloriously awaiting us, the fullness of our redemption. Now, Jesus made atonement for us, and that's what it's saying here. It says... Um, whom we have now received the atonement. There's great joy in that. And I hope that if you're a Christian, that you're walking in great joy and expectation of the fullness of your inheritance. Not according to the world and all the promises of the world, you know, uh, re, the worldly, re, uh, worldly Christianity says, oh, you're, it's all about gaining the world. No. It's about losing what's old in order to gain what's new. That's what it's about. And we're not talking about material things, we're talking about spiritual things, things that can never be taken from you, things can, that can never grow old. I mean, you know, we've been working on this house ever since we moved in it. You know what? We have to go back and redo it. That's the reality of the world. But in our spiritual kingdom, you don't have to remake, redo anything. It is going to be in a complete, perfect state. So there's so much we have that's been offered to us. Jesus made atonement for us. But atonement in the Old Testament simply pointed to covering sin. Covering sin. So it did. You know why sin had to be covered? So man couldn't even approach God. If his sin wasn't covered, then he could be judged. So his sin had to be covered by the sacrifice of the blood of animals that covered the sin. But with Christ it was different. Yes, he made atonement. But he went one step further. He didn't just, he didn't cover our sin, he took it away. Now that is so important. Because as long as your sin is covered, it's still there. Well, if it's taken away, it's not there any longer. And Jesus took our sin away. Now, you can read about that reality in Hebrews chapter 10, 11 through 14 when you want to. But he took our sin away in order to do what? To bring reconciliation. You see, when atonement was made in the Old Testament, man could approach it. God, but he could never ever enter into a real relationship with God. So it's only by taking away our sin, no longer there, that we can enter into reconciliation. So when we talk about Jesus making atonement, 
we're talking about reconciliation. We're not talking about covering, we're talking about reconciliation. In the Old Testament, it's covering. In the New Testament, it's reconciliation. Reconciliation between God and man, between you and God. So let's consider what verse 12 says in chapter 5. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death huh, whew, passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, Paul's laying out a case here. He just got through telling you, okay, you're, you're ungodly, you're a sinner, you're an enemy. Okay? Jesus had to, but in spite of that, God still provided the provision of Christ. And then he goes, he talks about the joy of having this reconciliation with God. But then he goes, and he's going to explain something to you. He's going to explain how it all happened. Because you say, you know, Rael, I don't intend to be a bad person. I don't intend to be ungodly. I don't try to be a sinner. I don't want to be an enemy of God. So how can this be? How can God judge man and be fair when we don't really understand why we stand guilty? In the first place, because that's not our intention. This is why it's hard for man to get saved. He cannot imagine himself being this way to God. <coughs> because that's not his intention. So why is God holding him accountable for somebody else's action? Why do we have to pay for Adam's blunder? Well, he's going to tell you why right now. What he's saying is by one man, one man, his name's Adam, sin entered into the world. One man. You see, when Adam sinned, all of humanity fell into a state of disarray. They were, fell into a fallen state where they became soulish and no longer spiritual. They prefer the fleshly things, the soulish things, and not the things of God. Their inclination changed. Their bent changed. In Adam, this all happened. We are born with this disposition. You see, because in our life and the blood, it's called the DNA. In the DNA, the DNA, which is the programmer of our life, is death. In our DNA, the programmer of our life, is this inclination to sin. That's where it came from, from Adam. It was passed down. It is an inherent condition, is what they call it. We all have it. And, and, and Paul's trying to bring this out. This is why we have this problem, people. We have been made enemies to, to God because of sin. And sin came through one man. But you have to realize through one man, it was taken care of. You see, one man created a whole problem. And one man brought the whole solution. It's not your fault. That's why God is giving you a way out of it. Look, you can change the bit. You can come to him. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. You can be restored. You can be reconciled. But you have to come to him for that. It may not be your fault you have cancer, for instance. It wasn't Steve's fault that he had cancer at one time. But you know what? He had to face it. He had to say, I have cancer. So what can I do about it? People, we have a sin problem. What can we do about it? We go to God. We go to the great physician who took care of sin. He provided the antidote. That's what Paul's really trying to get in to our heads. 
Okay, now what we're going to see in these next verses as we go through it is an incredible contrast. What Paul's going to point to out is remember, he just got through talking about reconciliation and atonement. What he's pointing out is the great exchange. Okay, Adam, Jesus. He's going to point it out. He's going to show you the big difference between the two of them. Why? You know why he's going to show you? Because what Paul is saying is, choose. Choose. You can't have both masters. You can't serve both. Choose. You're either going to be influenced by the old man in you, or you're going to be influenced by a new man. Choose. That's what he's going to do in these next verses. He's going to say, maybe it wasn't your fault, but you have a problem. It's not my fault if I get some disease, but I have a problem. And I have to face it. And I have to own it. It's mine. Okay? Every mankind has to own the problem of sin in their life before they're going to face it. So here we have this incredible contrast, but it points to the exchange that takes place when one truly comes to the cross of Christ to be forgiven, justified, sanctified, and made heirs to a future glory. Now what you're going to see is there are two influences upon us. We're coming under one mainly, but it's either the old man Adam that's influencing us or the new man Jesus. In one man, we have death. In the other man, we have life and untold riches awaiting us. So choose. In one man, we're wondering, uh, wandering around in darkness, but in the other man, we have been raised in high places of authority to gain eternal perspective. So let's look at Acts 2. I've already told some of you that we're going to look at this Acts 2, and he's going to talk a little bit about this. Acts 2. It's going to be 32, 33. It says, this Jesus hath God raised up. This is Peter's sermon, by the way. Whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now hear and see. In other words, Jesus has been risen. He has raised from the dead. And we are witnesses of that. Okay? So if you go over to Romans 8, just a couple of chapters over, we're going to look at verse 34. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He was raised up as man in a glorified body to continue to make intercession for us as a high priest. He sits on the right hand of majesty, right points to authority. He has all authority. And it's been given to him, according to Matthew. Now here's the final one, Ephesians 2, 6. I love this one. I always go to this. And you have to remember, if you are born again, you're hid in Christ. You're hid in Christ. Ephesians 2, 6. And this is the great promise that you have. Already you have this promise. Look at what it says. And has raised us up. Notice how it says, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in what? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are positionally right now in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Your life is hid in him. He's up there and you're there with him. Yes, are we walking in this rotten world? Yes, we are. But positionally, we're in him already. We are living already in a sense of resurrected life, even though we don't sense it and feel it right now. 
but we have been positionally placed there. We live in the midst of a worldly turmoil because of one man's action, people. One man's action. We're seeing all this. Those special creatures, they're paying the price for Adam's action. You're paying the price for it. But I want you to know you can step outside the cycle by receiving Christ and change that and have eternal life. That's what you can do. And so it goes on. As we look at this, we live in this midst of a worldly turmoil because of one man's action, but through the other man's sacrifice, we can come to places of peace and rest. One man opened the way of death to all of us. The other man opened the way of life to all of us. The grave has silenced one man by the name of Adam, while the other one rose from the grave and now intercedes on our behalf. Now that's quite something when you look at it from that perspective. So this is what it says in Hebrews 7.25, those who have it. Hebrews 7.25. Now, it talks about his priesthood, but this is one I learned as a new Christian, too. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is able to save you to the uttermost. When you look up the idea of uttermost, it means highest triumph. It points to the concept of highest triumph. It's not some just get by, just get by. No, it's the highest triumph that you can imagine. So once again, we, an exchange has to be made. One man sacrificed all. We're talking about Adam. You know what he sacrificed because he won independence? He sacrificed you and me. He sacrificed everyone in his loins so he could be independent. So he could be his, do his own thing, be his own person, not be answered to God, answerable to God. I want you to think about that. But I want you to think about the other one. The other one sacrificed himself, himself, so that you and I could be reconciled back to God. Now, we could go on and on. We're going to probably in the next couple of weeks. And we would never exhaust the great contrast that we're about ready to see. Now, the great contra exchange that occurred on the part of both of these men, Adam and Christ, what Adam changed in the garden was reversed by Jesus, who submitted his will in a garden called Gethsemane. He gave way to the cross to die on our behalf. And he gave up his life to declare one thing. It is finished. I paid it all. As believers, we have the life of Christ in us. A life that is not only eternal, but promises us abundance now in the great barren wilderness of this world and forever in the glory yet to come. So what Paul's going to give you today, what he gave you today, what he's going to give you in the next couple of weeks, is a contrast. And the same challenge is there. Choose. Choose. Don't be complicit. Choose. Who you're going to follow, who you're going to believe, who you're going to serve.